definition. The church is the body of people called by God's grace through faith in Christ to glorify him together by serving him in his world. God reveals his glory through the corporate body of the redeemed. All right, I'm going back. I'm going to do a little review here. A little review. The visibility of the gospel is more than just speaking and proclaiming. It is the living out. To put it another way, Christian proclamation might make the gospel audible, but Christians living together in local congregations make the gospel visible. In John 13, we are also taught love one another. This is a beautiful visibility of the gospel. The church is to be the appearance of the gospel. It is what the gospel looks like when played out in people's lives. Take away the church, and you take away the visible manifestation of the gospel in the world. That's a big deal. At least in my opinion, that's huge. It is believed that an understanding and following of these nine marks that we're talking about will help us to live out, to live out the gospel in the local church. So today, we're going to talk about conversion. This is one of the subjects that we need to have a clear understanding of if we're going to live in a local body that will help one another and to help those that may join or come into this local body. So what is conversion, non-religious? What does it mean? What's conversion? The change. Change, who said it? <clears throat> change, you're right. Change. I said it. Do I get a gold star? You, you get a gold star. <laughs> you get a double gold star. Yes. Change. Did you say it? I did. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the process of changing or causing something to change from one form to another. It, it's that simple. Uh, but now we, what we want to do is we want to think about it in the religious sense when we think about change. And so, do you think people can really change? I mean, can people really change? I mean, not, not just breaking a few habits or transforming, you know, their appearance. You ever see somebody today that you've seen, hadn't seen for years, and they're like, man, I don't even recognize her. Not, can people really change? Really change at the heart? Change the whole person that is deep and lasting? Is that possible? If the intent is there. If the intent is there, okay. No, not without. Not without. And with Christ. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of tracking where you're going with that, Arlene. Um, in one sense, the Bible tells us that people cannot change because we are sinners by nature and our hearts are corrupt, right? And so in that state, you're not going to see much change, but that's not the whole story. See, God has the power to change us and change us deeply. So in our conversion, God raises us. Think about this. God raises us from the dead. He gives us eyes to see his glory, and he grants us to turn from our sin and trust in Christ so that the entire worldview, our entire worldview is different at the core, at the very core. That's a big change. That's a big change. And we need to think about that. We, think, we need to think about not only that, but we need to think about the fruit that that may produce. So, all people, and so I asked the question, you know, do we really need change? Well, all people desperately need change uh, because we, by nature, we are alienated from God. We're rebellious toward God and subject to the wrath of God. So, I'm going to review some scripture here over the next few minutes. There is nothing here that you haven't heard before, right? And But I, I'm trying to pull it all together and so that we can get it fresh in our mind, and then we're going to open up for some discussion about how this fits into the local church. So, because we are alienated from God, I'm going to read Romans, excerpts from Romans 1, 18 to 32. Do we need change? Um, well, you tell me. I'm going to just read highlighted verses because we've gone through this passage, actually, the providence of God many times over the last two or three weeks. All right, so verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Verse 19, what can be known about God is absolutely plain to us, right? And 20, so we are without excuse. 
but we became futile on our feet. 22, we became fools. So God gave us up in the lust of our hearts to impurity. And 25, we exchanged the truth for a lie. So God gave us up to dishonorable passions. And we did not see it fit to acknowledge God. So God gave us up to a debased mind. And we know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Deserve to die, verse 32. What does it mean that God gave them up? God turned them over. What does that mean? He, yeah, yeah. he released them to their own passions. Yeah, yeah. He turned them over. It, it, it's almost like, because people ignore the truth about God and worship other things, and it says that God sentenced mankind to live in an unchecked expression of their impure desire, right? A condition that can only be undone by the gospel. So this is what you want. This is what you want. You can have it. Now live in it. Now live in it. Free and so, you know, that's the condition. I'm sorry? Free will. Free will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It can only be done or undone, this state, by powerful, regenerative work of the Holy Spirit to renew the will, to renew the affections, renew the will, renew the affections, and give a new heart. This is what happens. So what's God's attitude toward humanity? Well, God is angry against human uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness. And the bad news is that we are desperately in need of change. But the good news is that through Christ's death and his resurrection, that change is possible. So how is that change possible? Because some people believe that people really can't change. We may be able to make some minor adjustments here and there, but we can't fundamentally change who we are. Well, I want to give you a couple examples that contradict that, and you're familiar with both of them, but both of them are so good that we're just going to review them quickly. The first one, of course, is Saul of Tarsus. In Acts 9, 1 through 22, I'm going to read portions of this. This is so good. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Breathing out murderous threats. But let that sink in a little bit. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters for the synagogues in the, uh, Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He bound them up. He bound them up and took them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So along the way, of course, uh, he's encountered by Jesus, uh, Saul, as he loses his sight. And then you got Ananias. He's on the scene. Uh, is to be sent to Saul, right? God said, you got to go to this guy, Saul. And he's saying, wait a minute, Lord. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people. Uh, your holy people in Jerusalem. And so you can see, he, he's got a reputation here. He is one bad man. He really is. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer. Why do you think he said that? Why do you think he said to Saul, I'm going to show him how much he must, he must suffer? Shock him? Shock him into changing his ways? Say again? I'm guessing. Shocking him to change his ways? Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How about to give him a realistic understanding of what lay ahead for him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I, I, I think that some have made mention that uh, when he said, I'm going to show how much he must suffer, like, you made these guys suffer over there, now I'm going to make you suffer. And I don't think that's what it is. I, I, I'm just throwing that to the side because I've heard or read that. I think it's going to be an opportunity. He's going to show him how much he's going to suffer. He's going to suffer. Paul really suffered. But he was steadfast to the faith. And so this conversion that he went through, this change of life, 
wasn't something on the surface. He was tested time and time again. It was real. And I think that's the whole idea, that we see this change after his eyes were, uh, he could see again, and he was baptized. Um, that change was real. There was no going back. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see, show him how much he's going to suffer. So we're going to see that his encounters, his trials, um, are absolutely, absolutely demonstrate the reality of the life-lasting, to the core change. So steadfast in trials are witness to the genuine faith. So Paul's conversion was real, lasting, isn't it? I mean, doesn't the Bible teach us that, right? When he's casting the seed, sometimes there's claim to be a conversion, but the fruit isn't there. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that because that's what we need to be careful of. But Saul had nothing to do with it. Yeah. That was not of Saul's choosing. No. Saul was on the road to Damascus and said, the oh Lord struck him down. No, and he suffered. no. And I think Saul already saw what suffering was going to cause. He saw that with President Stephen Stoning. Standing there. And, and when the Lord called Saul, he said, it's hard to kick against the goods. Mm -hmm. I believe he had been going Saul for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent point. But yeah, you're right. He wasn't going there wondering, is this a good thing that I'm doing when he's on the road to Damascus? Now, he was made up in his mind, right? Well, God you, changed that. What you read Romans said, God gave them up to the base mind. It doesn't say God gave us up to the ability to choose good and evil. Yeah. God gave us up to the base mind. He gave us up to evil. Everything we do yeah. that with our will is yeah. not good. Right. Great point. All right, real quick, little little sidebar here. Um, in First Timothy 1, uh, 12 through 17, is that what was the purpose um, that Paul uh, received this mercy of change? And I want to read this to you in verse 12. I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that came from Jesus Christ. He filled me with faith and love that came from Jesus Christ. So this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. Then others will realize they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. So all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. So in our conversion, we can be used as a prime example to others of his great patience and his mercy all for the glory of God. And this is this is the whole point of, of the conversion, of the salvation, right? For God's glory. We are to be witnesses now. Are we witnesses now? Right? In our behavior, the way we live, these are the questions I think we need to wrestle with, right? Because I want to live in a way that's commensurate with what I've received in this conversion. So, one more. Uh, this profound change doesn't happen just to the apostles. This passage makes me kind of snicker a little bit. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 uh, through 11. Again, this is the Apostle Paul preaching here. Would you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. This is preaching now. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So I'm just wondering what it was like sitting in that congregation when he's listing off all these nasty sins, right? And then he points to them and says, this is what you once were. And the Father go, yeah, how do you figure that out, right? And so... But that's the beauty of this, is that this isn't just for the spiritual giants, this is for the congregation in general, 
this is how you people used to be. And there is this profound, fundamental change in your life at the core that your whole worldview has now changed. You don't see anything. If you're a believer and you have been converted, you don't see anything like the people around you that are of unbelief. You're nothing like that. You may have some opportunity to enjoy some of the same things they do in the way of hobbies and good conversation and some friendship, but at the core, you can't be further apart from them because everything, everything has changed at the point of conversion when we receive a new heart. And so it, it, it's, it's interesting because um, it kind of begs the question, that what I see in myself, and we're going to handle that, I hope. So what is the change that we need? Well, Jesus teaches, in order to enter God's kingdom, we must be born again. Born again. That's a huge word. God himself must give us a new nature in order that we would believe in Christ and do God's will. Gee, if you were around in the late 60s and early 70s, do you remember when that, that phrase became popular again? Born again. Mm -hmm. uh, you're one of them born again. Or, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Some of you guys are a lot younger than me or are saying yes. Do you remember that? Born again? Okay. Okay. I remember when it was really big. Are you born again? Or, well, let me explain what that means, and then I'll tell you whether or not I'm a born again. Because people have a lot of misunderstandings, like uh, Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. He was in need of a radical change that could only come from God. And in, in John 3, um, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, he said, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And so Nicodemus was wrestling with this idea, like people today have been wrestling with this idea, because he said, Well, how can somebody be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, and Surely they cannot enter a, a second time into the mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, of course. But the spirit gives uh, birth to the spirit. So, of course, we're talking about spiritual things here. So you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from. Or where it's going, so it is with those that are born of the Spirit. Um, so he talks about this baptism. I think the most reasonable interpretation of that is he um, refers to baptism, but in the context of repentance, right? It's not just, it, it, there's a, an element of repentance here that John is talking about. That's why, uh, I'm sorry, um, that Jesus is talking about here. And this is why John the Baptist, the ministry of baptism, I think, was the precursor to Christ. So, the exact reasons why this happens down in verse 8, nobody really knows. It's really a mystery to us. We really can't see the wind or predict our dangers about it. But in the same way, the Holy Spirit is, um, isn't sometimes something that we can completely understand. Final verse on this. Ezekiel 36. Um, Lord says what? 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So I, I, I guess it begs the question for me, is it evident that we now have Parts of flesh and the indwelling spirit. I mean, sometimes if I self examine, I think, I think, am, am, I, am I really, am I really a child of God? And this is due sometimes to a persistent sin in our life, right? And that a habitual sin. And I'm like, am I really a child of God? Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not questioning my salvation, but I'm questioning my behavior. 
And I'm looking at it, and sometimes in, in a little turn of frustration and despair, I'm like, where, where is this new heart? How is it that I am regenerated when I continue in this? And I, I think we, we need to kind of peel that back a little bit. I'm sure you guys understand what the answer is, but I, I just wanted, for the sake of completeness, I wanted to just push this thing forward a little bit because there's a difference that we think we need to understand between regeneration, conversion, and sanctification. Those three things, they, they are kind of brother, sister with each other, but if we're going to understand where I am spiritually when now I have received this new heart, but I, I seem to be wrestling with this old stuff, what's, what's going on here? So let me just, if you give me a minute, I just want to go through regeneration, conversion, and sanctification. So <clears throat> regeneration is God's sovereign activity by the Holy Spirit in the soul of one who is spiritually dead in sin. Regeneration is the implantation of new life in the soul. New life in the soul. Regeneration gives the gifts, gifts of repentance and faith. That's the beginning. Without that, there, there can be no moving forward, right? Regeneration gives the gifts, right? We see the sin, we turn from the sin, and in faith we receive Christ. That's the point of regeneration, right? Conversion is a little bit different, right? Conversion is the response of one who is regenerated. So you regenerated. The Holy Spirit has done this good work. And now there's this idea of conversion. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Conversion is the first exercise of the new nature that was caused by regeneration. So conversion is the first exercise of the new nature in ceasing from old forms of life and starting a new life. It is the first action of the regenerate soul in moving from something to something, the conversion. It is a decisive break uh, with old patterns of sin and the world and embracing of the new life in Christ. It involves a change of will, which is a volitional change, an intentional turning from sin and turning to God through Christ to seek forgiveness. And we have this whole new disposition in life. So, regeneration, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in His mercy and His kindness gives us the gift of, of repentance and faith. And then that's the beginning of this new life that we have now, where we are endeavoring to seek His will, right? This, this decisive change in our lives. This is the process. This is the conversion that we talk about. This is the big change. Right? Regeneration. And now everything is new in our lives. Uh, there's an intentional turning away from sin and a turning toward God in Christ for forgiveness. And a decisive break from the old patterns of sin into a new life. Now, this is hard, right? Because there's times when we don't see this. And that brings us to the following, right? Regeneration, conversion, and then sanctification. This is the third part. So, sanctification it means what? It means sanctify, setting something apart that is special use for God. If we look at the Old Testament, I'm sorry, if we look at Hebrews 10.10, 10, tells that, uh, that we as followers of Christ, we have been sanctified. So, we are positionally, we are righteous through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So, positionally, that's never going to change. That's if you could if you are born again, positionally that's not going to change no matter what your behavior is. Um, so, but however, most of the time when we use the word sanctification, we're referring to the progressive work of God to make a believer more like Jesus Christ. So that's what we're really talking about. So Paul wrote, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. 
and other things that Paul makes clear in other areas of Scripture. He commands Christians to present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification, because believers have been set free from their slavery to sin. Interesting comment. We are set free to be slave to another. I love that. That's my favorite thing. I am free to be a slave to Christ, right? So, because believers have been set free from their slavery to sin, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. So, you, you see, um, yeah, Matt, jump in there. It's a good time. Mm, well, it's interesting. He uses the analogy born again. And yeah. we think that's a, a one-moment thing, right? Mm -hmm. That moment when you are born again. And it, in some sense, it is. Right. But if you think right. about it, the analogy, if you look at it from the whole picture, that baby had to grow for nine months before it was born. Yeah. There's a there was a long process before right. birth. Yeah. Yeah. That had to take place, and then after the baby's born, there's a lot of growth that has to continue until that yeah. baby yeah. matures into a, an adult. Yeah. And so I, when we hear born again, like my brain would always used to just go to that one moment. Yeah. And if you look at yeah. the actual like analogy. There's a, a lot of growth that happens before the birth, and then a lot of growth that's going to take place after the birth. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if that's not more how we're supposed to look at being born again and salvation in general, that it, it, a lot of times it's a process beforehand, up until yeah. conversion. Yeah. I don't think conversion is maybe a one moon kind of thing, and then a lot <coughs> of growth back and forth. Yeah. Growth. Yeah. Um, and not just a one time. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That, that's a great point. And, and doesn't God groom? Did you ever meet someone who is is has been regenerated and conversion and turned life to Christ? Do you ever see the way that God kind of grooms their life up to that point? That's kind of like this yeah. Like sometimes you can actually see, you see like what I, what I would describe as you see the growth in the womb happening. Right, you, right. You are watching them through circumstances. Like they haven't come to know Christ yeah. yet. Yeah. But you know someday they will because they're actually still growing to that moment. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't know. That's the best way to Maybe I'm wrong. Yes. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. So when you were going back to your initial talk with my child and God, yeah. um, and then you talked about our position in Christ. Yeah. I think that's so key, Ken, to help us to learn to struggle, but to struggle yeah. well, is to remember, okay, at my regeneration, I was justified. Yeah. You know, God declared me righteous and holy, so even though I'm struggling, yeah. looking at me as, as righteous and holy yeah. as I'm in my son, you know, in the sun. So that kind of helps me when I'm struggling and um, so you know, to confess and repent, but to never ever forget the beauty of justification. Yeah. Yeah. And that I'm clothed with the righteousness of yeah. my So so I, I see conversion as the beginning it, it, it's that turn, and now I see conversion as the beginning of the struggle. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the beginning of now and the freedom to follow something completely different. So, for example, um, in sanctification, both God and the Christian have specific responsibilities. So Paul <coughs> commands believers to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? So this isn't just like this conversion process and it's a done deal. The whole process of sanctification now is the rest of our lives until we reach glory. For it is God who works in you both, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is the one who does the work of making us more like Christ, and we participate in that work by life of continually turning from sin and demonstrating our faith in Christ by obeying God's commands. The Holy Spirit plays a key role in this process as we walk in the power of the Spirit. We will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's a progressive work that will be complete. Uh, until the end. So, when we look at this, we, we are reminded that there's two things that can happen. We'll talk more about it next week. You can, you can get into the process of sanctification, and you're looking at, man, am I really a child of God with this behavior? And you can drive yourself to despair. Or, on the flip side, we can be very presumptuous here. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, I've been saved. You know, grace. I'll just fall back on grace, fall back on grace. Well, that's equally as difficult, right? That's wrong, too. There's a narrow path here that we, we must continue to take and walk by, by the Holy Spirit. So it, it's, we just have to be careful. 
But you know, when it comes down to, I've heard expressions of conversion, and and I, and I you know sometimes fruit is hard to see, but when the overall disposition of a person has not changed, right? They're still following. They're still looking at the world as the end all, and there hasn't been this. And I know when you're going down this path, the fruit's going to vary, and you're going to you're going to have good days and have bad days. But sometimes I don't see this. That worries me. It worries me because I have friends like that, and they they claim a faith, but the world is their end, and so there hasn't. If there was just like, the world is behind me, I'm going down this way, and, and I'm falling down, and I'm falling down, and I'm falling down, I'm like, it's okay. You're still, you're still moving in the direction that you have been converted to. You see, I mean, your disposition of life is completely different. So, two, and then I got it. Okay, okay, Roger, and then Jeff. Well, it's all about bearing fruit, right? We're fruit bearers. Yeah. But sometimes that fruit is immature. Yeah. It's not ready to be eaten yet. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's bad fruit. It's, no. It no. means it's not mature fruit. Right. But a saved man is a changed man. Right. So I, I believe when we struggle like that, at least for me, it's evidence of my salvation. If it's I wasn't a, saved, I wouldn't care. Wouldn't care. I, I could get it's a, it's a very good point. But I, I don't rest there too much. Sometimes no. I got it. No, I can't say what, but, but the key is there, I struggle. No, yeah, I you're, in the battle. you're in the battle, and you're going to be in the battle if the life, if the heart has been renewed, right? Paul says he, he fights. It's a he fight. runs the race, yeah. he flails, at, he's yeah. not flailing at the air, he's right. laying in bunches. Yeah, yeah. But Jeff? Yeah, I, uh, when thinking about conversion, um, the, the gospel writer John said very early in the gospel, um, a couple of verses that I think are just really key for me anyway in, yeah. in understanding conversion. He says, He, Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Yeah. And he clarifies it. Who were born not of blood, yeah. nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, right. but right. of God. Yeah. So there's a receiving of Christ that is so, I, I believe, necessary in the conversion, a looking to Christ yeah. and to welcome him. So if you're welcoming him, yes. regardless of the things I you know, got going on in my life, I could be yeah. an alcoholic, I could be on drugs, I could right, be, right. if there's a receiving of Jesus Christ, that is, I believe John is saying it is very important. Yeah. It's like the, the most important thing, receiving yeah. Jesus. Yeah, a genuine receiving of Jesus. Yes. Okay. Yes. I clarify that only because this yes. past week I have heard people pray the prayer yes. of receiving Jesus. And they all claim this person has been saved. Uh, not saying they're not saved. I'm saying, as other pastors that have joined me have said, well, maybe we wait <laughs> and see, because people can say things and repeat things without the heart. But, but that right. person's only fooling themselves. I, I understand. Because Jesus yeah, knows the heart. Yeah. They may be a false convert. Right. Right. Possibly. But I don't we, know. we can't tell that. No, we, we, we can't. can't either. But... Certainly, in my heart of hearts, I know my heart of hearts. Yeah. I know I have received Christ yeah. to the best. Well, I'm still yeah. working on it. <laughs> I was going to say to the best I can. Well, and then um, I have one more quick yeah. question. Yeah. I don't know that there's any answer to this, but when we got saved, when we Nah, you'd probably stray from him. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Um, I don't glorify God. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Even in the, even in our sin, we can still glorify God. I haven't thought about it. Um, 
think about it. I think mean, that's the thing with conversion is there's no time you didn't want God, you rejected him. God does things in our lives, brings us by his grace, salvation. Yeah. And now you know you're still a sinner because of the Holy Spirit, but yet you're bringing all honor and glory to him still now. Yeah. You never did before. Yeah. And that's only between you and him, not yeah. between anybody else. Nobody else knows my relationship with God. Yeah. It's yeah. God. Yeah. So you really do know. And that honor and glory to him is wow. Yeah. But a real evidence to you of conversion. Yeah. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. Because a lot of people say, why am I here? We're here to serve the Lord. Yeah. That's our purpose. Yeah, that's true. Um, so the, the, the question is, why do you think it's important for us as Christians to clearly proclaim that people are in need of radical change? I mean, what would happen if we muted that part of the Christian message? Well, we, um, we would be in, uh, in violation of God's directive. Yeah, we would. That we pray for laborers and we get out in the heart. Yes, I, I, I agree we'd be in violation of that. But, and, and that's an important reason to do it, but what's the result if we don't? What's the result to the people that we're talking to? Um, for example, I heard this preach just this past week. Um, God wants to heal you and make you whole. No, no, no speaking there of a new nature, no speaking there of a rebirth, no speaking there of a new heart, just this is, you feel like you need a little healing? You see where I'm going with this? Why is it important? And, 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 I, and I'm going to let you answer this, but what are the ways that the local church as a whole can clearly communicate this need for change? Sheena. Well, I think why it's important is because without change, right? It cheapens the grace of God drastically. And yeah. I think also, it's partially I mean, with Bill's question, I think that's why we still struggle, because it accentuates the beauty of God's grace daily, but not struggle. Mm -hmm. Without God's grace, whew, it would be impossible to have. Right. So like, when you, when you take that out of it, it's a cheap solution, and it's not really real anyway, but it's Cheapens the grace of God, yeah. and it wasn't cheap, right? And so right. it's very almost blasphemous yeah. to what Christ did. Yeah, yeah, okay. excellent answer. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, true. So when you save somebody, they tend to make you whole. Right? And you only say that you, you've distorted the relationship and you've distorted the yeah. standard, right? So it's like, so, for, so first of all, God becomes. God becomes the um, the servant, and you become the master. Right? Yeah. He's there to serve yeah. you in your yeah. need, and he's this great benevolent person being, but he's going to serve your need, and that's the point. But then the other thing is, you you offer no standard of what wholeness is. What does it mean to be whole? Um, and so, like, and you can't understand that without a standard of good and evil. And you have no standard of good and evil without a God yeah. who is good. Yeah. And so, when I guess the in that scenario, the question that needs to be posed to the person is, what exactly do you mean by wholeness? Yeah, yeah, good point. Thanks. Um, yeah, Diane. I mean, I would say that God doesn't necessarily want you to be healed or whatever. God wants your heart, and God wants mm -hmm. your repentance. And God's not promising you healing and prosperity. And, you know, he, yeah, I mean, you're taking yeah. out the gospel, and you're saying God wants to heal you and restore you. Whatever, yeah. you know, God wants to make, have good things happen to you yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You're taking out the gospel. Yeah. You're not looking for repentance. You're, and maybe you don't want, maybe he wants you to go through this valley. And yeah. 
So, so yeah, go ahead. Well, we'll, well, Paul responds to that with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he pleaded with the Lord three times to have a storm removed. God mm -hmm. apparently didn't want him to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when he left Trophimus someplace sick, <coughs> I forget what the reference is in the New Testament. Apparently, God didn't want him to be better. God doesn't right. always right. want us to get better. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I see this misunderstanding in 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 some places that I that I attend at the church, and it's that um, Christianity is um, I've got my life and the pieces are falling together, and now I, I just need just a little bit, just kind of round out my life, and so I'm going to add a little Christianity so I go to church and get a little bit of money. And so it just kind of rounds my life out. And to me, that is not even close to what we're talking about here in conversion, a radical change, radical change that only the Holy Spirit can do. And so we pray to that end, but we preach it, right? We preach it. We say, well, you, you need... Everything has to change. Now, you know, you're still the same person in a sense, but your whole worldview of everything changes. Otherwise, it's just cheap. It's just cheap grace. Oh, I'm going to come here, and I'm just going to add a little bit of fullness to my life because now I'm a Christian, and I'm not feeling quite as guilty as I used to before, right? That kind of thing. And then there's also there's, there's going to be little expectation um, if we don't preach this message, there'd be little expectation of the person that is seeking, right? Uh, there, there's no expectation of change or fruit. Well, how do we, we, we have to teach them that there is an expectation of change, and that change is very radical. And that message often gets lost, as does the message, total depravity, right? Mm -hmm. They come to me for a little healing, for a little bit of this, and I'm saying, no, that's not the point. The point is you're lost, you're eternally damned, and you are not because by nature you need to be completely and radically changed. So total depravity and this whole idea of conversion is key, key to the local church. So... Um, what are we doing here in the local church as a whole to communicate this need of change, right? This need that, you know, we've got to be watching each other, right? We've got to be, and a lot of this does fall on the elders and pastors, especially during the interview process where they want to hear a testimony that kind of gives them, we don't know people's hearts, but kind of gives them an understanding that this heart really has changed. We heard the way they were. We see this change in heart. We see a new disposition. We see this endeavoring to follow after Christ. We see this longing. We see this desire for the word. Um, we see, yeah, there's ups and downs, but the people continue to move forward in a godly way. This is big in the interview process. There's churches that you go to, sign this card, you're a member. And in a nine marks church, that, that's, that doesn't work. And so a lot of understanding um, of whoever it is that is joining the church, it's nice that you get to know them for months and months and then the joining process, right? But what else? What else can you do? <coughs> We're not on the board. I think walk the talk. All right. There you go. There you go. Um, that's it. <coughs> Yeah. Um, we got an opportunity to do the witness to her. Um, we got a slip of again, and it's like once, but she yeah. said that she's there. I started to put that she's going to church. Yeah. She mentioned that. She's watching. She's watching right now. So I know people watching you. So are you living a life that's holy and glorifying to God, or are you living a self-advocation and glory? Right, right. What, what's the what's the, the best way that the uh, the best witness that the church has to an unbelieving world? What do you think yeah. it is? Love for one another. Love for one another. Mm -hmm. Who said that? <laughs> love for one another. That's an amazing witness because you're not going to see that in a lot of places, in a lot of your, your secular organizations. Although a lot of them get along pretty good. Um, but 
this agape, this, this sacrificial love for one another is our best witness. Isn't that amazing? So I gotta keep myself in check. I have to ask myself, is that what I portray when I am here? Am I praying for my brothers and sisters? Am I, am I forgiving? Am I asking them to forgive me? I, this, this is the witness that we have. Okay, next week, we're gonna talk about the fruit, the fruit of conversion. What are the fruit? the fruits of change. And then, how should this, again, impact the local church? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that regenerates us, that converts us, that changes us, that gives us a new heart. Where would we be without it? This is who we are. Where else would we go? We have nothing, nothing more that we desire, Lord, is to chase hard after Christ. Help us to do that when we're down. Pick us up, Lord. Please protect us from the evil of the world. Protect us from our own hearts. Protect us from our own desires. Lord, give us the will to do what is pleasing to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to demonstrate that we have hearts that truly have been converted from the darkness and evil of the world to the glory of Christ. Help us to show that this week, Lord. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.